So, had the ancient Greeks invented the ancient world's first ever machine gun? Well, that's what we are going to be checking out in our first episode of the Grand Library. Hello, all you fresh minds of the cosmos. I am the Keeper of Knowledge, and with the help of my mechanical clockwork constructs, the Archives, we will help explore history and the timelines of the multiverse, teaching many of you interesting historical facts you may not have known. Today's episode is tackling the question, did the ancient Greeks construct the first ever stationary rapid firing weapon in the ancient world? And from what my Archives and I have discovered is that this is a very strong possibility thanks in part to the Greek engineer by the name of Dionysus of Alexandria. And no, not Pope Dionysus of Alexandria, born close to the same time, but the engineer and not the Christian. I know it's confusing, but history is like that, which is why double checking your sources and fact checking are always important. And you know what you are talking about and you make sure your sources are credible as well, instead of just sprouting incorrect data to the masses. <laughs> Hmm. Oh. Whew. Sorry, Archives. That was, uh, that was a pretty bad cough indeed. Anyway, the weapon itself is known as the polybolios. Poly meaning many and bolios meaning thrower. The sources about the mention of the polybolios are the writings of Philio of Byzantium and his modifications of antiquity siege platforms and artillery used by armies at that time, publicized in his first-hand accounts in the Beliopica. As always, sources are down in the description down below under sources. Now, most scholars believe that the Beliopica was written in 200 BCE. However, this is a guess, as multiple Greek engineers, inventors, mathematicians, physicists, writers, artisans, basically people who, one, either didn't get laid much, or two, had a bunch of free time on their hands, helped work on a series of books that the Beliopica was a part of. We also do believe that it was written sometime between the early to mid-3rd century BCE. The Beliopica itself was written in the land of Egypt, specifically the Kingdom of the Ptolemaic Empire. Which itself is quite fascinating, actually, and I gotta do a video series on it. But, yes, Archives, I know, I know. One project at a time, unfortunately. Now, in the Eastern Mediterranean, if you wanted to get your knowledge on, there were two places where science, art, literature, and everything that would wet the pants of any scholarly intellectual could go to at this time. In the Ptolemaic Empire, you had the wondrous city of Alexandria where scholars from not just the empire, but the entire known ancient world flocked to in order to be a bunch of adorable geek Greeks. Now, Alexandria had also a massive engineering boom going on, as Alexandrian engineers were some of the most competent and skilled specialists of their time, such as Philio of Byzantium and Dionysus of Alexandria, who had studied mechanical engineering within, can you guess? You guessed right, Alexandria. Good job, you used some of your unused brain cells for the day. However, the island of Rhodes, which was not a part of the Ptolemaic Empire, mind you, was the second place you could go to practically learn about any intellectual or academic fields of study. It's kind of like the ancient world's version of Yale or Harvard, I suppose. Don't make it into Harvard? Well, that's okay. You can pick a second-rate school like Yale. Uh, hey, 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 hey. I kid, of course. They are both terrible. Princeton is where it's at. However, Rhodes and Alexandria did work strongly together hand in hand, on account that the Ptolemaic Empire and its leaders of Rhodes were actually quite fond of expanding research and the development of fields of knowledge through state subsidies. This prompted achievements in many fields of knowledge, like architecture, engineering, science, and even the art of how to brutally kill loads of soldiers on some poor farmer's flat irrigated fields out in the middle of bump nowhere. And so the devious Alexandrian engineers came up with a weapons platform that would meet their military and government rulers expectations, and that would be the ancient world's first ever machine gun, the Polybolios. Now, when asked why the Polybolios was made, it's simple, because Philio and the Alexandrian engineers wished to skim through field artillery schematics such as the Beliopica and simply improve them to make them much more efficient. 
The engineers from Alexandria wish to achieve balancing firepower with cost efficiency and other categories to make effective field artillery. Dionysus' designs of the Polybolios was heavily improved upon by Philio and other engineers as they designed the modifications in the city of Alexandria and set out to the island of Rhodes to test and construct these specific weapons of warfare. Though it's not mentioned, I could also see another reason being why Ptolemaic Egypt wanted to improve its weapon designs. And that was probably on account of a massive neighboring state next door called the Seleucids, who just f***ing <laughs> hated Egypt. So that was probably a valid reason. Insert Alexander fanboys and their empires fighting each other trying to be as great as he was. Basically, this was Philio's mission, as he points out in the Belliopica that he wished to perfect the art of artillery designs. The Polybolios was a stationary ballista very similar in design to the Scorpion. However, unlike the Scorpion, the Polybolios was a vastly more complex weapon that was specifically designed to fire multiple arrows within a single time frame, whereas the Scorpion would fire a single arrow that was to be loaded each and every time. The Polybolios was like the Scorpion, only it had a faster rate of fire and could fire more arrows, anywhere between 1 and 5 arrows each time it was loaded. Filio describes in the Belliopica how he'd improved the designs and goes over the main workings of the Polybolios. Now, how the Polybolios worked was quite simple actually. A loader would put in a single or multiple arrows into a tall wooden chamber. Gravity pulled the arrow down into a wooden cylindrical device that had two wooden grooves in the cylinder as the operator rotated two levers at the back end of the device, which in turn, literally, turned two metal iron sprockets. These sprockets then turned a wooden or metal chain that turned the cylinder, causing the arrow to drop down and being pulled back with a metal claw. This created tension in the sinew strings of the device, and after the claw hit a trigger mechanism as the operator cranked the arrow back, it would launch the projectile outwards. After the arrow or the projectile was fired, all the operator had to do was rotate the levers forward to cause another arrow to drop from the chamber. Therefore, rinse and repeat. As long as the loader could load the polybolios, then the operator could fire as many arrows as they had in the weapon. Essentially, the ancient equivalent of a modern machine gun. Now, many of you may be wondering, why wasn't it employed on battlefields as much in ancient history? The Scorpion, despite being much slower, saw a lot more service than its counterpart, the Polybolios. I mean, you would have to be stupid, really, not to deploy a technological piece of equipment like this, right? Well, you see, the one problem with the Polybolios was that it was too good. Just like the Tiger Tanks of the Second World War, the Polybolios was a very complex machine that didn't match the set of parameters the Alexandrian engineers had set for each artillery piece they tested. Now remember, the engineers were balancing cost efficiency with performance of the weapon, so they focused on these requirements, taken from the Belliopica. 1. It can shoot far. 2. It retains its strength in the heat of battle. 3. It is easy to construct. 4. It is easily assembled, strung, and disassembled. 5. It is in, quote, no way deficient in appearance, add a bunch of ancient Greek words I'm not even going to try to pronounce, to the standard design, and 6. It is less expensive. So using this list, we can check and see if the Polybolios was indeed good for a battlefield situation. Number 1. It can shoot far. Well, not really. The Scorpion is said by some sources that it could fire between 100 and 400 meters. The Polybolios could fire a max range of only 200 meters. That's not far when you have a huge battlefield between two armies, okay? That's only one and a half football fields in length. That may seem like a big area, but for ancient battlefields at this time with massive armies being deployed on them and the space between them, it's not really that big. Number 2. It retains its strength in the heat of battle. Also not really. The tension of the strings were described by Filio of needing to be tightened to a certain parameter, otherwise they would be too loose or would break under the tension. And since these are sinew strings we're talking about, moisture would definitely cause problems for them. And since it can fire a max distance of 200 meters, well, that tells me that's as tight as they could make the sinew strings for the weapon. Number 3. It is easy to construct. It was not easy at all to construct. The engineers did write special directions on how to construct it, as well as other siege artillery. But unless you were an engineer who knew what you were doing, the common soldier wouldn't be able to figure it out. 
Plus, unlike the Scorpion, which was lighter and of a more simpler design, the Polybolios had a vast array of complex moving parts, and took many resources to produce. Why build one Polybolios when you can construct five Scorpions, essentially? It is truly the warfare of economics. Number 4. It is easily assembled, strung, and disassembled. As I mentioned before, not so. It had many complex moving parts and took an entire team to construct, let alone disassemble after a battle. It had to be specifically strung and tightened, and was a full stationary target to enemies. Number 5. It is in no way deficient in appearance to the standard design. Now, the Polybolios was in no way deficient in appearance. In fact, I would argue and say that it exceeded expectations for the Greeks and later the Romans who used it. But it just wasn't practical enough to use on a battlefield. Small skirmishes or battles, maybe, but a massive field with huge armies? No, not at all. For one, it took up too much ammunition compared to the Scorpion, and another problem the engineers complained about was that it was too accurate. Ah, well, you would think so, Arkai. But on a battlefield where massive armies are sprawled out across entire fields, literally, you don't need a weapon to be too accurate. Hell, you could throw someone who is a sh shot and they can hit a mass blob of enemy soldiers. Now, accuracy is important to a degree, but what you really need in the case of the Polybolios is the weapon to have a wide range and spread for maximum killing efficiency. Number six, it is less expensive. Though I couldn't find price numbers, I would imagine something this complex for the time was not at all cheap. So yeah, it would be super expensive to construct and to maintain on a battlefield due to the complexity of its many moving parts. So unfortunately, the Polybolios was not used as much on ancient battlefields or sieges. However, like all great powerful nations in history, you just steal the ideas of your adversaries and implement them into your own army, culture, or nation, or what have you. And Rome was no stranger to such open-mindedness. Yes. So later, after Rome took over the Greek city-states and conquered Egypt, they would implement many of these improved artillery designs into their own Roman legions. The Polybolios and Scorpion were no stranger to the Romans, though just like the Greeks, the Romans used the Scorpion Ballista a little bit more. The Polybolios would see limited service on Roman frontier regions, or on hilltop positions out of the reach of enemy armies. While the Polybolios saw limited service with Rome and the Greeks, the technological ideas and engineering of the weapon is what truly is amazing. The Greeks had essentially made the first ever machine gun for the ancient world, and I think the Polybolios should be a true testament to the modern world, that though its inventors were in ancient times, they certainly were ahead with their ideas. Thank you so much for watching this far, if you have. You are truly awesome viewers and students. And if you would like to support the channel more, please like the video. It only takes a few seconds out of your day so YouTube can promote our content. If you wish to see more, click that bell icon next to the subscribe button and subscribe as well so YouTube can notify you about future videos. And if you want to help us become more independent from YouTube, then you can support us on Patreon. It's optional, of course. You don't have to oblige if you don't want to, but either way, it does truly help. If you want a map commission for a history project you are doing, or a story you are writing, or even a D&D game, my commission prices are up on my main Twitter, so you can follow me there and check out our posts, as well as updates for future videos and content. Thank you all so much, and the Archives and I will catch you all later. Bye-bye.